Hi, everyone. Christine here. Um, as you know, many of you know me. I am also on the Women and Leadership Committee with my colleagues here. And I also work for Atrium, where I am a national sales director. But most of all today, I'm happy to introduce to all of you our keynote speaker, and that is Ava Milko. And before we hear directly from Ava about her personal journey and insights, I'd love to provide you all with some amazing career highlights, and, and they are some amazing ones for sure. So Ava is an international business executive with over 30 years experience in running global functions, product development, and revenue generation engagements with a focus on business and human transformation while also building customer advocacy. If that doesn't keep her busy enough, she is also managing principal and executive advisor at the Thought Foundry, a boutique agency dedicated to organizational transformation. And her work does not stop there. She is also a marketing and supply chain professor at the University of Denver in Denver, Colorado. And prior to her current roles and responsibilities, Ava was the managing director at Procurement Leaders, the largest membership network of procurement and supply chains executives in the world, leading North America's operations, business development, key account management, and also client advisory services. For nearly 15 years, Ava had a long and successful career at Molson Coors, leading various large scale procurement and supply chain transformation initiatives. But before Molson Coors, she was also head of procurement for 3Com Corporation, where she was responsible for post 3Com robotics merger activities. And Ava also began her career at Motorola as an industrial engineer. So without further de um, delay, I would like to introduce to you Ava Milko and hear her personal story and finding her why. My gosh, Christine, um, thank you for that introduction. I, I feel like um, I should be retired or listening to that. And, and <laughs> in many ways, um, I am, um, but, uh, but we'll get to that in, in my remarks today. Um, listen, before I begin, I want to uh, do a big shout out and a big thanks to ISM New Jersey for their ongoing willingness to collaborate with me and uh, for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces uh, on this call. I am uh, truly feeling part of the East Coast community uh, and thank you for, uh, for letting me in. I am um, dialing in from Vail, Colorado today. Um, so I figured that I give you a bit of Colorado fall in my background. Uh, it is a beautiful day today. And um, for the first time in about three months, we're actually seeing the blue sky uh, with you know, all the smoke coming in uh, from the West Coast. We've been um, living very much in the haze um, uh, from, from the fires. Um, so yes, this is meant to be an interactive and fun session. Um, so I will spend a few minutes um, sharing my story with you. And then we can open it up for, for conversation and Q&A if we, if we have um, time. In my typical fashion, I uh, do try to offer a different point of view, uh, but it will also reinforce um, some of the things that you may have heard from, uh, from your prior panelists um, in the past few weeks. Um, as you've heard from the introduction, um, like many of you on this call, I spent a uh, majority of my career, almost 30 years in, in, um, in the corporate world, uh, first as an industrial engineer, and then as a procurement and supply chain executive. Uh, but one of my biggest passions in life, uh, throughout my life, um, has been advocating and supporting uh, for women's rights, our equal rights as the other 50% you know, of inhabitants uh, of this planet. Uh, and this is why I'm very happy to be part of uh, this Women in Leadership Forum. Um, I do need to pause and give kudos to the men that are here. Uh, thank you for be being our allies. Um, you know, this is not just about the women that you work uh, with, but also the women that are in your lives and uh, your personal and, and professional lives that, that you are uh, supporting. And by simply showing up here, uh, you know, you're, you're voting um, uh, for what you believe and, and uh, as, as has been mentioned already, I think uh, we are very appreciative to have you here. Um, 
I will touch on this later, but in 2018, I left uh, the, the corporate world um, to pursue a totally different life. Um, I went off grid. I completely checked out, built myself a cabin in uh, remote parts of the Colorado Rocky Mountains. And, uh, and here we are. Uh, some of you have uh, been following on, on LinkedIn. I have been sharing my off the, the grid um, uh, ex experience uh, very sort of openly and, and I'm getting a lot of uh, really interesting feedback from that. I think I'm gonna become an expert now on how to uh, uh, move to an off grid location. Uh, but yes, indeed, in my spare time, I lecture at University of Denver as a professor in supply chain and uh, marketing. Uh, but I also, um, when I married, my, my second marriage, and we'll get to that, when I married um, for, my, for my second time, uh, I began a executive and, and, and um, a coaching practice, working with professionals like yourselves um, to figure out your priorities, to help you gain clarity on some of your key decisions, um, or to perhaps develop just a more holistic view of your leadership style. You know, in a nutshell, what I do today is I help individuals, teams, and companies thrive. But before I needed, you know, to do that, I kind of had to figure that out for myself. Um, so I was asked to speak uh, and, and spend some time with you guys to kind of keep it to my more personal experience, um, keeping in line with, um, with the theme of this conference, which is around, you know, finding your why and, and, and reason for purpose. Um, and so for the past couple of weeks, um, as part of this conference, we've been contemplating and sharing one of the most fundamental privileges that we have as a human being, the sort of finding our meaning and purpose, right? Reason for existence, understanding why the hell we're here. And we've heard from a variety of speakers who share their stories. Um, and I just need you for a moment to just pause and appreciate the fact that this is truly a privilege. Uh, many of us have arrived sort of at the top of this Maslow hierarchy of needs in terms of self-actualization and we kind of got stuck there. Um, and in my case, you know, I've had a lot of time to think deeply about the issues um, and topics that are of interest to me. Uh, and indeed developed my own point of view on the subject of purpose. So, so this is purely coming from my own personal experiences and observations. Um, you know, please, please take it as such. A little bit more about me because you've heard my professional story, but I was born and raised in Krakow in Poland. I am the oldest daughter of a mom who was a teacher and an engineer father. Um, I was raised in a communist country um, under martial law, and we eventually escaped to United States in the early 80s. Now, this part of the story is super important uh, because it shaped me and all that I'm about to share with you, okay? Um, fast forward 30 years later, you know, I found myself a rather successful executive. I was multitasking my way to the top, uh, being a wife, a mom, you know, a mentor, uh, volunteering my time, you know, just living the American dream. And unbeknownst to me, I was about to experience a personal and utter train wreck. Um, in retrospect, when I dug deeper, you know, I concluded that I was um, just way too busy doing all the things that the world sort of expected of me. And like many of you, I was trying to be of service um, to the world, to the many around me, and I was killing myself doing it. Um, and that's our dilemma, right? Um, prior to COVID, um, I could literally feel the advancing speed of these trains that we call life. Um, and the level of busyness around me was just so difficult to comprehend. And, and, and uh, frankly, it's, it's just not sustainable. Uh, we have a title for it. Uh, it is called the VUCA world, right? Um, we are asked to not only find ourselves in this volatile, uncertain, 
complex and ambiguous environment that we call VUCA world, but also to lead ourselves and to lead others. You know, and then we have this purpose thing that we need to figure out. Um, and finding my purpose seemed like yet another, you know, shit that I had to do on my, on my to-do list. Um, and you know what? You don't need to look far to see that even finding our purpose, the most intimate conversation that we should be having with ourselves has been commercialized and it is a lucrative business. And so it struck me when I analyzed, um, there was a recent um, executive board research which stated that only 18% of leaders were capable of leading in the VUCA world. And I thought to myself, well, duh, of course. Many of us are essentially running on empty. And then my next question was, you know, who are those 18%, right? And I think something um, is seriously wrong with that number. And it highlighted for me how inadequate we are in running this self-imposed bullet train that we call life. Now, interestingly enough, guys, we've had a number of interventions. If you sort of pull up and you look at the interventions along the way, you know, a few that, you know, I can remember, you know, first one being the fall of Berlin Wall. Uh, then we had 9-11. Then we had the 2008 collapse of uh, Wall Street. And now we have a series of very serious societal interventions where you know, we have an opportunity to stop and change the conversation. And when I look around, you know, we're all super keen on wanting to change the world around us, but very few of us take the time to work on the most important person, which is ourselves. And I begin to understand that this particular issue really correlates to that 18% number. You know, and I think COVID to some extent is forcing us to deal um, with this topic. Um, um, you know, long before uh, we were forced to quarantine, I did exactly that. In 2018, I removed myself um, almost entirely from the world of business. Um, I experienced a massive burnout which was a result of about 10 years of running on empty and completely ignoring it, you know, and at some point it had to give. Uh, and that year for me was 2018. I realized that I never, ever properly grieved the death of my father. I never processed surviving stage four cancer um, or the end of my 25 year marriage or the loss of a job that I absolutely loved and I had to walk away from. You know, all of that happened for me in a, a kind of a rather condensed period of time. And you know what, what did I do? I went straight back to work and it caught up with me in 2018. And I just simply um, needed to pause. And so there was a book, there was a, there was a book on my library shelf, which many of you may know from uh, high school literature. Um, it is Walden by Henry David Thoreau. And this became my inspiration. Um, guys, I too went into the woods and I went looking for Eva. And what I'm about to share with you may shock you, but I am uh, almost 100% sure that finding your purpose is almost impossible without knowing yourself first. You know, Simon Sinek, you know, famously said, you know, hey, let's start with the why. But I will challenge that formula. And I say that we should always start with the who. Um, and that is, uh, that is in my mind, the commitment that we can all commit to. That is that one thing that we can absolutely change uh, when trying to change the world is, is beginning with ourselves. You know, and it's funny because many of us look for a purpose like it's like a pair of winter boots on sale. You know, we're, we're hunting for it, you know? Um, and this work needs to be done, guys, not when we're brushing our teeth or, you know, cooking dinner or running errands. You know, finding your purpose um, requires two things. Um, 
and, and that's just my personal opinion. The first is the needing to pause um, and really uh, finding a time and a space where you can um, rec you know, where you can get into this kind of deep and slow examination of self. Um, you cannot find your purpose when you're running 100% of the time at all times. It, it's not just going to show up. Um, this is a deep and slow examination of self that we all must commit to. And so, you know, um, like a few on this panel in prior weeks, I absolutely embrace meditation um, to its full extent. Uh, this was one of the hardest things for me to do. Um, you know, a person that's on the go, a person that's a, a, a hard driven executive, you know, try to sit your butt down, you know, for 20 minutes and uh, just be with yourself. Even just being with myself was the most difficult thing to do. But in time, I realized something really, really profound. I realized um, that with practice and in time, there is this very small pause between our exhale and our inhale. And in that moment of pause, all comes to a standstill. And it is the most beautiful and safe place that you will ever be. And those of you who meditate, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I begin to long for that moment in time when my breath slow down to find that pause, because that is exactly where I began looking for Eva. Um, I had four questions that guided my inquiry, courtesy of one of my most favorite mentors, um, an author, Wayne Mueller. And this guidance comes from one of the most beautiful books um, I have ever read. The book is titled, How Then Shall We Live? Where he proposes the four essential questions that we all need to answer for ourselves. So because I am a professor, please take out your notebooks. Um, here we go. I'm about to share those four questions with you, okay? The first question, which is actually seemingly very easy to ask, was the most difficult to figure out. Who am I? Who are you? You know, we identify with our profession, with our roles. You know, we say things like I'm a mom or a wife. We identify with our hobbies. I'm a gardener, I'm a painter. We identify with our moods. We identify with our circumstances. You know, I'm unemployed. You know, I'm a son of an alcoholic. Um, but what I needed to process and what I really challenge you to process is what happens when all of that gets taken away? When this disappears, when this dies, or when the body gets really sick, what's left? And who are you in those moments? This question was one of the most intense questions to examine for me because I connected with my Polish roots. I connected with the history of my family, with deeply seated values, uh, with my culture, with, uh, with the stories that believe it or not still reside in your DNA. We don't get rid of them, they're, they're with you. Um, and you know, and for me, there was no escape from it. You know, my calendar had nothing but wide open spaces in it and I needed to embrace it. I needed to accept it so that I can possibly potentially change it. And in that process, I begin to understand the concept of impermanence. Nothing remains the same, everything changes. And resistance only makes it harder. You know, I contemplated on times when, you know, I hung on to things out of obligation or despair or desire and just how futile was that in the end? Um, and so that's where your inquiry begins to, to, to happen is who are you? You know, who am I? The second question is, what do I love? And this is when I begin to remember all the small things that fill my life with joy. A cup of cappuccino in the morning, listening to Vivaldi Four Seasons in some church in Prague, a sunny day, 
you know, a fabulous tiramisu, you know, or a glass of Prosecco uh, on a lovely summer afternoon, or, you know, watching a sunset on a beach in Florida with my husband. Um, I started a book of my favorite things and experiences, and I begin to catalog all that I loved. And, and that has become one of my favorite books to reference. You know, some talk about gratitude journals, um, a book of things that I loved worked for me. Um, and then I ask myself the question, why do I not do these things on the daily? And this really opened my eyes and it became my new commitment to me to fill my day with things that I love to fill my day with things that bring me joy. The next question can be very easily ignored or set aside, but I needed to face it head on. And the question is, what type of life do you want to live knowing that you will die? And I never thought about dying until I almost did. Stage four cancer does something magical to you. And if you happen to survive it, as if it was in my case, it completely eradicated my fear. It just killed it in me. I stopped being afraid in my post-cancer world. I stopped being afraid of having difficult conversations. I stopped being afraid of saying no. I stopped being afraid of speaking my piece. I stopped being afraid of being me. Um, and it brought sort of forward a level of patience with myself and with the world. But at the same time, there was no time to waste to live a life that I would be proud of and to take with me to the grave. And I think it was David that talked about that last week, um, you know, in his, in his remarks. The final question uh, really helped me solidify my gifts. And this one poses actually a lot of trouble um, to many. And so I ask you, what gifts do you have that you can offer to the humankind? And why aren't you sharing them with the world on a daily? You know, I realized that I was good at so many things and that the world appreciated when I spoke or when I wrote, or when I shared my thoughts, or when I baked, or when I brought a community together. And that is now my new normal. Um, I realized that the life that I had up until my train wreck was not the life that I wanted. I wanted to thrive and I wanted to show others how to do it. And so in my trusty journal, I wrote for months on two topics. The first one, I wrote down what I wanted my day to look like from morning to the evening, every hour on the hour. What would bring me joy? What would my day be filled with? How would I end my day every day? The second topic that I journaled uh, uh, on with massive intention was the kind of partner that I wanted. Um, I looked at these on a daily basis. Now, I'm happy to tell you that I um, have indeed found the most amazing man in my 50s. Uh, he literally jumped into my car one night, and that is a true story. Uh, we dated, we engaged, and we are now married. Um, from there, I became a certified coach in wellness and in thriving, and the rest is history. Um, yet again, another fabulous mentor, uh, Renee Moorfield, um, she's an amazing coach on wellness and thriving, and she's the one that really helped me see the life for what it is and what it can be. Um, so those are the four questions. And you see, when you first focus on the who, you will find some really amazing richness in these answers that will lead you to the essence and appreciation of your purpose. Um, because guys, there, in my opinion, there's no mistake why you're here, okay? So let's not complicate it. We are here to live our most amazing lives as defined by you and only you. And only you can take that journey. 
And it's a journey that is meant to be taken alone. There are skilled people out there who are totally capable of helping this process. But I got to tell you, stay away from the heavy marketing bullshit, you know, about how inadequate we are in finding out why we're here. You know, your reason for doing things will change from one chapter of your life to another. And here's the model that I found super, super helpful. When you simply change the language of I have to do something or I have to be something and substitute that language for I choose to do this or I choose to be that, this is where you live your life on purpose, okay? It's just that simple. When you consciously go about your day and you choose who you want to be, how you want to be, and what you want to be doing, you are living on purpose. When you succumb to this idea or rhetoric of I have to do this, then you're not living on purpose. And that's a very simple test that you can do with everything that you do. Are you choosing it because you want to? Are you doing it because you're choosing it and it's your conscious choice to do it? Or are you doing it because you have to? And if you have to do it, that's not living a life on purpose. It's, it's a simple change in your mind shift. Now, once you figure all this out, the most amazing thing that can happen is uh, when we change the conversation from, you know, hi, my name is Anu, uh, what do you do? Nobody gives a crap about what you do, okay? Let's change the conversation to tell me about you. And we will begin to connect with people like never before. You know, I realized that when I went back to Poland, you know, and I spoke to my 80-year-old uncle, and I tried to explain to him what a procurement supply chain executive is. He didn't give a crap who I was. He didn't give a crap that I ran a company. He wanted to know, do I still care for him? And he was thankful that I came to see him. And that's really the only thing that mattered to him. Okay. You know, if you, once you answer the question, who am I? And it, it, you know, and, and then you can listen with curiosity and empathy to the story of who the other person is. Then something really amazing happens, guys. We can start asking the collective question of who do we want to be as people together? Who do we want to be as people? And what are our collective gifts that we can use to address our problems and opportunities? And what is our collective contribution to humanity? To me, these questions can fundamentally change your relationship with yourself and with others. And so guys, I challenge you as leaders to first take the time to know thyself um, and then role model uh, what I consider a mandatory shift, shift in a leadership conversation. This is one of the most opportune time that we have to shift our collective understanding of who we are as people. What do we love? How do we want to live our lives knowing that we will die? And what are our collective gifts? Why are we here? How do we use these insights to create progress for ourselves and for those around us? Um, so I will end um, by saying that not only finding out who I am as a human right now is necessary, but also creating a daily routine of imagining my future self. Thus creating this daily intention to transform. And, you know, honestly, that's, you know, a greatest reason for me for being. And ultimately, you know, that sort of transpired to my vision. And my vision is to spend my time creating a world that works for all. Um, and, you know, and for me, frankly, that is just enough. I will pause here and uh, uh, we'll take it from here. Um, you know, thank you for, for having me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious and open to hearing reactions and, um, and let's have a conversation for a few minutes if we can. Thank you.
Ava, I don't know if you can see the chat, but um, first of all, thank you. What an amazing story. Uh, I have like a billion questions for you, but I just wanna share with you that Maria um, said, uh, what an incredibly courageous cancer survivor. Yes, Ava, why is it, why it always take, why does it always take a life crisis for us to see what is truly important? Um, and Tamara just said, love off the grid. And she loves Krakow. Her family's doing an apartment there next year. <laughs> Oh, come on down. I have. I come on down. I have. Uh, I have. Uh, in fact, you know, people said to me, "What? You know, you love Poland so much. You should start taking people to Poland." And uh, you know, maybe I'm going to start an, a little travel travel company on the side. Um, well, reach out to me if you do, because we love to go. Thank you. Yes, I've got. I I can probably. I, I could be busy with just Krakow trips between now and you know 2050. So <laughs> uh, anyway, um, yeah, awesome. Um, and then new had asked if uh, she would love to hear more about off the grid life. Yeah, uh, honestly, it is so hard these days to check out. And um, I, I'm one of the people who follows you on LinkedIn. I love your stories on how you put your home together. It's, I, I mean, I don't know if everyone here follows you. Would love for everyone to hear a little bit about it. Yeah. Um, so. Um, uh, we own um, six acres. Uh, we bought six acres in the middle of nowhere. Um, we, uh, my, it was my husband's vision, uh, husband number two. Um, I married, uh, I married three years ago and uh, very happily married. And when I, when I met Jason, uh, we had a lot of very deep conversations. And that's how I knew that this man was a man that um, was going to be a good partner because he was willing to be vulnerable. You know, in our first date, you know, he said, look, I don't want to put up with a lot of bullshit. You know, I'm in my fifties. This is what I want in my life. And, you know, that really connected me with him right away. So we looked for, for some property in Rocky Mountains. We ended up with six acres uh, of virgin land, lesson learned, uh, virgin land um, uh, equals a lot of money to develop. Um, uh, <laughs> but, but you know what? I used uh, all the experiences that I've had in negotiation, in relationship building, in working with contractors um, to make this dream happen. So, so uh, the first thing you need to know is that when you uh, want to build off grid, um, you've got to understand your counties. Uh, rules and regulations. Uh, we wanted to initially have a tiny house. Our county does not allow to have tiny houses. Um, and so I, our tiny house had to sort of double uh, reluctantly um, just to have the proper permits. Uh, from the permitting process, you have to know basically anybody in the county because guys, counties and especially remote counties, these people rule the world. They actually believe they rule the world. Okay, and so you have to really understand um, what their motivations are and uh, try to get into their good graces. From there, we um, uh, a year. It took us a year to develop all the infrastructure. So drilling 700 feet into the ground to uh, get to water, uh, installing our septic tank. Uh, we had absolutely no electricity on the land, so. Um, you know, $60,000 later, there was still nothing to show for. Everything was in the ground, <laughs> okay? Um, and that was probably a moment I was almost ready to give up, okay? Because um, building a house on your own requires a lot of patience. A year later, we, um, we have a house. The house is fully off grid. We have our own septic facility. We have our own water. We have our own solar panels. Uh, uh, we have about 1,400 square feet, uh, two, two offices uh, for me and my husband, a master bedroom, um, and then a lot of uh, land around us. And so um, one of the things that I actually thought about doing, uh, so you guys give me some feedback, is as part of my executive coaching um, uh, experiences, I want to bring women to my land. Um, and do you know an overnight, uh, two, three nights, bring your tents, um, you'll get a bathroom, you'll get some coffee in the morning, but you're gonna be completely excluded from the world. I mean, we absolutely, we have no, no cellular 
um, um, coverage there. We had to, you know, bring in internet. Um, and uh, that was actually quite, believe it or not, that was probably the most difficult thing to, to, to understand. What? There is no internet here? Um, but in time, I realized that, that believe it, you know, when I started to really study this subject, believe it or not, the, the most privileged in the world in the future will be disconnected, okay? Because we are so connected, we are so connected that only those who have the ability to disconnect will be disconnected. And I actually read some very interesting research that talked about places called white spaces on our planet that you know, 30 years from now, you're gonna have to pay a lot of money to actually disconnect from the world. And so um, you know, we, are, we are ahead of that curve and there's something magical when you wake up in the morning and it is utter and complete silence. It, the silence is so silent that it actually hurts your ears. Um, and there's no escaping from self, there's no escaping from dealing with you know, who you are as a person. And so that's the life that I'm embracing. I think I am a better human because of it. I, I really believe that the life I was leading um, was killing me and I needed to step back, I needed to pause and I needed to kind of reconnect with nature, with myself and you know, everything that's important to me. So follow me on LinkedIn, I will continue to um, share my crazy, my crazy experiences on six, six acres in the middle of nowhere. Um, just on the side, Ava, what was the book you mentioned earlier? I think you said walled in Walden W A L D E N. I'm surprised you have not had that in high school. Um, Walden is a book that was written. Does anybody know Walden? Anybody read Walden? Okay. Victor, Victor. Re okay. Victor. Do you remember, what do you remember from Walden? This is, this is, this is now a Eva Milko as a professor lecture. Here we go. Well, it, as you said, it was one of the books that we had to read in school, you know? And again, it did seem like a very nice way of life, what he described, you know, as you described, what, you, what you've actually gone after, I think. And, uh, you know, I never thought about doing that, but uh, it's a, it's a, you know, the way you describe it, it's a great thing. And I think it's a good way to get away from, you know, the, the, uh, the bullet train that we're on right now that a lot of people are on. I'm retired now, so I'm off the bullet train, but I know what you mean. So, yes, yes it's a great uh, it, It's uh, Walden or Wal Walden's Pond. That's another way to Google for it. Um, Henry David Thoreau, T-H-A-O-R-O-R-E, I gotta look it up. Um, how to spell I -E -A -U. it? I E A U. I E A U. Thank you. Um, you know, it's the book is considered um, the one of the uh, most profound classics of all time. One of the 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 most the, the top one hundred books ever written. And this is a book that was written in eighteen hundreds. You know, this is a man in eighteen hundreds that was already seeking a a connection with nature and with self. You know, I, I don't want to get into a lot of the woo woo stuff, you know, but but in my in my exploration, you know, one of the most important things that I found is that we are energy. You know, I don't care how you, you know, call yourselves, but at the end of the day, I'm just a bundle of energy, okay, that has, you know, that has a mass to it. But as energy, you know, I connect with the rest of the energy around me. And, you know, when we, when we exclude ourselves from this very chaotic energy of a busy life and you reconnect with a quieter, more simpler life, you know, there are, there are whispers of your heart that begin to get really loud. And then there is no escape. And then you have to ask yourself, what am I gonna do with it? In my case, I ignored the whispers of my heart for a long time I could, until I could not ignore it anymore. So um, Walden by Henry David Thoreau. And then the other book that I mentioned is by Wayne Mueller. And the book is titled, How Then Shall We Live? And that's where you get a more deeper exploration of those four questions that I um, shared with you. 
Can you give us an example of the last statement you said? And hi, my name is Tori. Um, you said you create a daily routine to transform yourself. Can you give us like a little example of that? Yeah, um, th that is, um, in fact, a foundation for sort of who I am um, today. So um, I'm, I'm not pitching my book, but I also wrote a book. Um, one of the things, and the book is titled Pause. Um, one of the best things that you can do for yourself, uh, first and foremost, is to pause. OK, so I used to get up at, you know, six o'clock. I actually now get up at four, four in the morning. OK, and I do that because I want to give myself that time in in quiet and private. OK, uh, there is two things that I think are important, um, Tori, Victoria, uh, your day, your morning routine and your evening routine. OK, my morning routine is about an hour and a half. I meditate for about 20 minutes. I journal every day for about 15, 20 minutes. Um, and then I do a lot of uh, breathing and yoga sort of exercises for myself. In that journaling, this is really important. Uh, now, some of you may say, Eva, that's crazy. I'm not waking up at four. Um, you can do some of that in the evening, but, but the problem that I found for me is that in the evening I was too tired. And when you're very tired and your brain is really exhausted, you know, I, I really don't want to spend more time thinking and writing. You know, my, my evening routine is much more about me, you know, nurturing me. So, you know, taking a shower, taking a, you know, a bath, turning off all this. So I read in the evenings, okay? I do my reading at night before I go to bed. Um, in the mornings, I journal and I meditate. Um, I also meditate at night in the evening, another 20 minutes. Um, but here's the interesting thing about journaling. Um, many of us journal about what happened. So we journal about our past, okay? Why? Because it's easy. As human beings, we have a very difficult time to project forward or imagine forward, okay? It is very critical that you begin to think about your future, forward journaling, okay? Where do you see yourself tomorrow? I'll give you an example. This morning, I wrote in my journal, how do I want to show up today with you guys, okay? Who do I want to be when I show up? How do I want to project myself? You know, what is the vision that I have for myself three hours from now when I am in front of 40 people? Okay, so, so forward intentions and forward imagining will move you, will pull you towards that future. If you cannot imagine your future, how the hell are you going to create your future, right? It's not possible. And so I shifted my journaling from what happened and how I feel about it to what are my lessons learned from that? But really it's about how do I apply those lessons in the future? You know, don't do that again, right? Um, and that's my daily intention. My daily intention is to end my day at nine o'clock at night, you know, having done these, you know, four, five, six things. And, and I think future journaling, I found in my case have been much more successful for me than just constantly rehashing what happened. And, you know, I'm not learning much from that. So was that helpful? Was that? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. I don't see any other.